I mean, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope you are doing well. Welcome to worship at the Rolling Roads Baptist Church. If you're still in the parking lot, hopefully you'll be able to get in soon. Tune in to your radio to 87.3 <laughs> FM, and you'll be able to listen to our service. Uh, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering will be received through next Sunday, December 25th. How you like that? Supporting international missions, and I believe we will see a DVD shortly. Also want to thank you for sharing your poinsettias with us. Those are these red flowers uh, natively grown from the uh, country formerly known as Mexico. There they are. Aren't they beauty? beautiful? Uh, Kim showed me a picture this week uh, uh, that these trees, they actually grow into big giant bushes, if you didn't know that. And they're pretty shocking to see. Uh, so if you take yours home and take care of it, you'll be able to have a giant poinsettia bush if you live in Mexico. <laughs> so thank you for sharing them with us and for your memorials and your uh, remembrances here on the back. However, we do want you to know that if you would like to take your plant or plants with you today, feel free to do so if you want to have them to enjoy this week of Christmas. If not, we would be happy to have them for another week. So it's up to you. I think we're going to take a few, uh, I think, to Raleigh today. But uh, Come to the manger. Lord's Supper is December 25th. And Christmas card delivery is available. Bring in your cards and they will be handed out for you. And you've seen the basket and everything back there. So with the conclusion of our official announcements, I would invite you to enjoy your worship today. spoke to the king and said, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as shale or high as heaven. But when the king refused, God would not be stopped. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. God wants us to know even when we aren't sure ourselves. God wants us to experience God's presence even when we think we can handle life on our own. God sends us signs of God's presence with us. All we need to do is keep our eyes open and look. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. We light these candles. The candle of joyous hope, of proclaimed peace, of deep everlasting joy, and today of presence that speaks of love as a sign that no matter our circumstances, we know we are not alone.
Merry Christmas to your neighbor. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.
other things that we have spoken of during these Advent weeks. You know, uh, if we look back through some of the famous biographies, who's that? Friend of my grandmother, by the way. You think I'm kidding? Uh, Albert Einstein didn't exactly follow the expected path for a scientific genius, much like myself. Uh, he took the college entrance exams, but did you know he failed them? Couldn't get into college. Ugh. But he finally did pass. But then he couldn't find work once he graduated. They say it may have had something to do with his haircut. Just kidding. Einstein simply did not follow along with the status quo or what everyone else was doing in order to succeed. But you know, he continued along, eventually winning the Nobel Prize for Physics, back when that actually uh, was a real prize. So Albert Einstein, how about that? So, our next case study, Abraham Lincoln, who was not a friend of my grandmother. Abraham Lincoln is also a great example of success after what seemed like failure. You may remember the story that they summarized that he bombed out in several business ventures, shall we say. Some were more legitimate than others. And while in the military, you know about his military career, he went from the rank of captain all the way back down to private while he was in the military. So the moral of the story for us today is that sometimes the initial expectations, sometimes the early estimations, sometimes the quick judgments, the early results, shall we say, sometimes are exceeded a very great deal by what actually ends up happening when we look back. And of course, the same is true of Jesus. The ancient Palestinian Jews had certain expectations of what the Messiah would be. And I'm sure the religious leaders of the day thought that they had it all figured out. They knew what the plan was. You'll remember that zealots and others expected a great warrior to come and to supernaturally overthrow the Roman government and Israel. This is what they wanted. There was probably very little expectation that the Messiah would be a regular guy, a carpenter's son, or even this. There might have been little expectation that a humble rabbi type person would be teaching the regular folks in parables. Amazing to think of. But there were those who knew at the time of Jesus' birth what expectations and what estimations and what ideas the Lord God Almighty had. God himself would decide what the Messiah would be. So I'll read for us Luke, I'm sorry, I'll read for us Isaiah, this does not say Luke anywhere here. I will read for us Isaiah, who starts with an I, chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, which we've already heard in our Advent light today a little bit. So here we go. Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray today that you will 
bless our reading of your word and our study of your word. We pray, Lord, that you would inspire us to understand and to hear your voice today. We pray, Lord, that you would lead us closer to you during this Christmas season and show us that Jesus is the King who reigns forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when we consider Jesus, you know, this prophecy does say a very great deal about him. These are remarkable verses. And Christians have always believed that this prophecy is totally fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And earlier in Isaiah chapter 9, you're familiar with the light that is dawning. Those who walk in darkness will see a great light. And uh, those who live in a dark land, the light will shine upon them. And so the people are going to see this. They're going to be amazed. And so God is taking action. God is doing something in and through history. You see here that this is very uh, practical, what the prophecy is saying. Very specific. And very great blessings and benefits are going to pour forth upon the people of the Galilee. And one of the things he says is the government will rest on his shoulders. A child will be born, a son will be given, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. Well, that sounds a heck of a lot better than the people upon whose shoulders it is now, doesn't it? We definitely want the government to be on somebody else's shoulders. So anyway, here we have a king or queen, you know, usually wears um, a stole or a cloak upon their shoulders. And they say this is kind of the symbolism here, that once you put on that robe, you know, once you have that crown, once you have that scepter, that means that you are endowed with power. And so that shows their power and authority to rule in the Messiah. So then, this child who is going to be given, the son that is given, the government will rest upon his shoulders. That's the king in the fullness of of the word very clearly a king and his name is going to be one not uh so so or you know kind of whatever or you know barely functioning his name is going to be called wonderful counselor wonderful counselor that is miraculous supernatural divine transcendent that's what wonderful is wonderful is wonderful it's an amazing word, and his name will be his character and his function. You know what's really weird is I read this, and I thought, well, that's not true. But then I looked it up, and I was like, hmm, this word for wonderful is somehow, I don't know how, made off of the same Hebrew root. You know, Hebrew language is all about these weird three-letter roots, which are all consonants, which drive people nuts. And I have been driven way past nuts because of it in years past, which we won't get into. But this word is made off of that same root, which stands for the extraordinary marvels. It's the same word that was used back in Exodus when the marvels of God in Egypt were described, which is really strange to me. But that's the same root word for wonderful for those plagues in Egypt and those judgments of God that were, that were made. So that's really something more I need to look into. But to me, this ultimately is a royal title, divine in every way, a supernatural king. And then he's saying, he's not just wonderful, he is a counselor. Counselor. When, you know, I think of counselor, I think $65 an hour, maybe covered by insurance, you know. But this is the source of true and faithful guidance. He's a wonderful counselor in that he personally provides guidance. So the Messiah is going to be characterized by his loving guidance within the covenant of God. And so we might pause at this point and try to consider more about this. You might say he's wise. You might say he's seasoned. Now, both of those words, wise and seasoned, could remind you of potato chips. 
But I don't want you to think about potato chips. I want you to think about the Messiah, okay? The Messiah. Wise, seasoned, and reliable words that he gives, which people might choose to use as the foundation for their lives, see? That kind of wise, wonderful counseling is what we can build our lives on. And this does carry the idea of advising, planning, and giving purpose to people's lives. You know, purpose, not just entertainment, but giving purpose to people's lives. So a wonderful counselor is a great leader, and that is what he is going to be. And it's phenomenal to think of this. Prophecy is from Isaiah. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Maybe there's a lot more to say. But the next word is this. Mighty God. He shall be called Mighty God. So it is at this point I, I would have to say relatively undeniable that this Messiah King will be God himself. So and he's called the great God, the mighty God, which is a direct reference to the ever able creator of the world. The mighty God, the creator God, the ever able God who made the world. Some people wonder, don't they still, where the divinity of Christ comes from? Oh, it was invented in the Roman Empire at the Council of Nicaea because people weren't really sure whether he was God. I, I just have to wonder about them. Read this verse and wonder no more. He shall be called, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor and then Mighty God. <laughs> kind of easy. And then the next word is Everlasting Father. Oh my goodness. An everlasting father. Now here we need to think of Father Abraham. He shall be called the everlasting father. The Messiah King is the eternal source and family head of all of his people. He is the firstborn of all creation. He will guide them and even bring them into existence as they repent and have faith, forming a new tribe as it is, a new tribe of Israel, as it were. He will be the fulfillment of the type of Abraham that runs from Genesis. But he will be present eternally. He is the eternal Father. That's the Messiah, the wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the child that will be born to us. And here's the representation of the child's birth that we have here today. Have you seen the manger yet? And finally, in all these titles, we have Prince of Peace. You saw the word peace on the screen earlier in our service. It's funny, isn't it? Often, princes and kings throughout history, one of the last things they want to make is peace. They want to make war. They want to have boots and cloaks rolled in blood. Why do I say that? Because it's in verse 3, right? No, verse 5 of Isaiah 9. That's what normal people want. They want war. They want fighting. They want conflict. Often princes and kings make war. But this one will not. He will be called the Prince of Peace. He brings peace first before anyone. And this, as we know, is the ultimate peace. This is a messianic peace. This is an, an end times eternal peace that's going to come. Jesus brought this peace by his death on the cross. As it says in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, Jesus brought peace by his death on the cross. So great. We're pretty sure 
by now that there are many ways to celebrate a holiday called Christmas. Children are being taught in school how people celebrate Christmas all around the world. And you know, we've seen all these things probably ourselves growing up, many of them. But I'd agree that there are really two ways at this point. <laughs> Y'all might have to bleep this out today. But there's the Christian way and the unchristian way. Silly, right? But the, the question is, which one do we want? Sort of, you know, the secular versus the holy Christmas. Or is it happy holidays that way, happy holidays? Or my favorite, happy winter holiday to you? You know, do we remember the point of the apparently recently newly acquired property of Apple, do we remember the point of Charles M. Schultz's A Charlie Brown Christmas? Do we recall the point? The point is, in my humble opinion, sincerity about the true meaning of Christmas found in the New Testament is what we need. At Christmas. We need sincerity about the true meaning of Christmas found in the New Testament. That's what we need. So I like the idea of thinking about God's promises during the Advent season. His promises that are here in Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7. As Christmas Day grows closer, we discipline ourselves to name God's promises. His purpose is to bring in the kingdom of God with us in it. Hello? To bring us into the kingdom of God. And Jesus was without sin. And he perfectly fulfills the law and therefore teaches us how to love God and mankind. We are to be his disciples. Jesus' obedience was not like mine. It was perfect. His obedience was perfect. Even to that horrible death on the cross. And that death was not for nothing. It wasn't just for someone to paint a picture. That death was the central event of human history, purchasing salvation. How do you like different leaders you've heard of throughout your life? You know, there might be some that you think are just heroes. Maybe they're military heroes. You know, you think of them, Douglas MacArthur. You know, my goodness. And, or maybe General Patton. Or maybe even uh, Rommel, you know, Erwin Rommel. Boy, goodness. You think of some of these big dogs, you know. Maybe you think of political leaders. Maybe some are heroes. Maybe some people have Ronald Reagan as a hero. You know what my grandmother said about Ronald Reagan in 1976? She said, ah, oh, he's just a cowboy actor. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Looking back, and I thought, oh, yeah, maybe he is. You know, and uh, we think of these leaders, and we, we wonder, do any of them compare at all to Jesus? Do any of them even, even come close? I imagine they probably wouldn't want to. But, but listen to this, what I have written in my notes. It seems like, no matter who they are, even Gandhi, you know, who's going to say something bad about Gandhi, right? Or how about Jimmy Carter? You know, who's going to say anything bad about Jimmy Carter? I mean, that's really serious, right? All of these people, we can name all the, the leaders that are like, you know, they all have flaws. It's amazing to think about. They have weaknesses. They have human frailty and failure as part of their, you know, their life. It's their people. Leaders lead through the humility, but they do it imperfectly, right? Oh, I read that wrong. Leaders lead through the humanity, but imperfectly. But the Lord Jesus, he leads through the humanity also. But Jesus leads perfectly. We must remember this. So Jesus exceeds all the expectations if this prophecy comes true, and we shall see that it does quickly, 
over it once again. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. I will read it all once again. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be called, he will be, I'm sorry, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Verse 32, wow. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. How do you like that? So 800 years after Isaiah, more or less 800 years, God begins to move. Generation after generation had passed until God makes his move at the right time, at the appointed time. And you know these angels, they're messengers, Servants carrying out his will, this particular angel, Gabriel, came with this seemingly to us looking back, and we've heard it every year, we've heard it so many times, a simple message, simple message, but with profound implications. Mary was chosen carefully to become what some faiths call the mother of God. You know, they many revere uh, Mary. Now, we don't believe this was because of was the Baptists, I'm saying, you know, me, Baptists, hopefully all of y'all, don't believe this was because of Mary's sinlessness or her own merit or her independent standing with God that she got from her parents, you know, and the story can go on, well, her parents were sinless, then her grandparents were sinless, and it goes on and on and on, you know, that's not what we believe. Here's what we believe. Rather, God chose her for this most special honor because it was his pleasure to do so. It was his choice. It was his decision. Mary's honor was her obedience to the Lord because of Jesus, both before and after. So how confusing this would have been to this, shall we say, seriously engaged young woman. Her plans were set. And then there's this encounter with this message. But Gabriel encourages her and he greets her kindly. And he may, you know, have known that she had that normal pain of fear. And so he interjects her thoughts with this word that we've said, do not fear, do not fear. And the immaculate conception would come upon Mary because of the Holy Spirit's work. And she was a virgin Two times, Luke says, she was a virgin in verse 27. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are. Jesus was fully human, yet, Hebrews 4.15 at the end says, yet without sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This was Mary's child that was going to be born. So, has anyone ever told you to not be afraid? I believe firmly that this is said far too little in our day. One very important Christmas message is do not fear have faith. Too many people in our society today are trying to lead by using fear. It's almost like the goal of society is self-destruction. But people can't cooperate. I think they couldn't build the Tower of Babel today if they wanted to. People can't cooperate well enough today to organize a two-car parade. Sir Topham Hatt on 
you know, Thomas and friends said very many times, you have caused confusion and delay. That's what God says to us, I guess. Self-destruction, self-sabotage, defeatism, excusitis, which is the failure disease. And they say, I can't. Well, Mary had none of this. Jesus had none of this. The New Testament disciples had none of this. And neither should we today. Here should be our message. Our message should be confidence, faith, power, and ability, all because of Jesus, the promised Messiah, the divine, fully human, fully divine Savior from God. We call this the Incarnation. And this is the symbol of the Incarnation here, a recreation of Jesus' birth. The divine word who has always existed became flesh like we are and lived among us, right? And you know, Gabriel announced to Mary and the world what Jesus' rule would be like. And it sounds a whole lot like Isaiah, doesn't it? It sounds a whole lot like those other prophecies. Jesus' person and work will be totally unique. He will be great, just as Isaiah said. Mighty God in our earlier verses. Here we have great God, just as God himself is described in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 17 says, For the Lord your God is the God of gods, and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who does not show partiality or take a bribe. Psalm 145.3 says, great is the Lord and highly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. So Jesus, Mary's son, announced by the angel, yet to be born, will be great and he will be called son of the most high. These again are very God descriptions, the divinity. Jesus is God's only begotten son. Jesus is all God. Jesus is all human. Mary's son, but God's son, but somehow Joseph's son too, you know. He'll be given the throne of his father David, reigning over the house of Jacob. Remember Nathan's oracle? Just as I wrote in this month's reminder, 2 Samuel 7, 16, Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever, and your throne shall be established forever. Jesus fulfills this prophecy of Nathan to David. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Amazing. In Ephesians chapter 121, Jesus' rule is far above all authority and power and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come. Paul says in Ephesians, the one to come. So we are part of an eternal kingdom established by God, inaugurated by his only son, his only begotten son. So Jesus rules over our lives in a spiritual way. And this is a spiritual way that flows from our souls that influences every other part of our life. So this Christmas, we can be mindful of the wonderful counselor we have in Jesus. We have heard the Christmas songs. They remind us of God's gift of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. All hail King Jesus. All hail Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Christmas encourages us and calls us to see him as he is, our king, our Lord, the founder of this eternal kingdom. And so as we worship and serve, we can do all in the name of Christ in celebration of the good news of the birth of Jesus. So you know, people were probably surprised by Albert Einstein and all that he contributed to science. I'm still wondering about some of it. And we're certain this was a big problem 
that the whole entire world, including his cabinet, was surprised by Abraham Lincoln as he was elected with 39.8% of the vote. Let me repeat that. Elected with 39.8% of the vote to be president of the United States and to save the Union during the Civil War. And yet, there may be those who will still be surprised by Jesus as they repent of their sins, trust in Him for salvation, and begin a life not of selfishness, but a life lived for His kingdom and glory. They may be surprised by this King who reigns forever and yet loves each one of us. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your kingdom, for your love for us. We thank you, Lord, for the word becoming flesh and living among us. We pray, Lord, that this Christmas, this day, this hour, this week, we would behold your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. because of Jesus, the risen Son of God, who still speaks the truth. Amen. And go in peace, friends.